Hey everybody, happy Friday. I hope you're having uh, a really great end of the week and I hope you're excited for spring break coming up in just a little few short hours after you take care of your last class obligations for the week. Um, today's, today's lecture I'm going to try to make as quick as possible on managing and leading organizations. Um, again, this is a, just kind of a, an introductory to this concept of management and leadership. And um, this is something that you'll develop more over your time here in the major um, <clears throat> with classes through the business area, um, business department. So um, I just want to kind of quickly go through some things that I think are really important in this chapter. Then you can do the reflection exercise um, assignment and submit that no later than tomorrow at evening at 5 o'clock. Uh, and then you can just take a break and enjoy spring break, um, you know, maybe Sunday before we come back to class. Um, on the 16th, you can read Chapter 12. That'll be what we will start with um, with sport marketing when we come back from spring break. So a pretty exciting topic, um, really fun one to cover, and we'll start that um, right after spring break. So, you know, when we when we talk about um, yesterday or yesterday's lecture, or Wednesday's lecture was about organizations and the design of organizations and how you structure organizations. Today it's about managing and leading those organizations because people play a vital role in sport organizations. Um, this chapter and this lecture helps overview some of the concepts involved in the management of people and the relevance of leadership and guiding um, activities toward the achievement of organizational goals. Um, well, we're kind of going to go through the difference between management and leadership, that there is a distinction between the definition of those two. Um, they are complementary functions, but they are distinguished in, in a, a few different ways. Um, management's, you know, refers to the process of working with and through individuals and groups to accomplish goals, and leadership is the process of influencing individuals and group behavior for a desired result. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but we're also going to talk about contemporary management theory. Um, and some of the five underlying functions that guide the concept of management, like planning, staffing, organizing, directing, controlling, um, and evaluating. We're going to talk about those a little bit. Um, and, and we're going to talk about the three basic skills that managers tend to use uh, when they are managing conceptual, human relations, and technical. Um, we'll talk about the top the roles of top level, mid middle level, superior, supervisory level um, managers, and um, how they're connected to certain managerial skills. Uh, we'll talk about some conceptual um, skills that are often exercised by top level managers, um, and thinking about like the big picture of an organization, human relations skills, um, and some of the other some of the other skills that are that are used by managers in sport organizations. Um, then we'll talk about uh, one particular theory of leadership, the contingent, um, the contingency theory of leadership. Um, that's really probably one of the more um, I sort of like uh, idealized or like um, favored type of leadership theory. And it's definitely been looked at and studied and researched quite a bit. So we're going to talk about what the contingency theory of leadership looks like, what it means, um, how it's how it is a more contemporary model um, of leadership, and um, it's you know it has that like sort of multi-level approach, multi-level layer approach, which is very popular and and. Um, you know, as much more accepted or like understood and uh, appreciated in today's contemporary sort of workplace environment, organizational environment. Um, and then we'll also talk about like decision making, the steps of de decision making, the difference between authority and power. Um, and then you are going to take a you're going to take some time to look at sort of the ethical um, and critical thinking components, and then also the social media aspect of managing and leading. I'm not going to go into those very much. You can read those in the chapter and, and respond to those in your assignment. So, um, so yeah, I mean, people play an important role in a sport organization, right? They Management and leadership, because they are two distinct things, we want to make sure we understand 
how management and leadership complement one another, but how they are distinct. And when we talk about organization, we, we look at organizations and how we study it as from like a theoretical perspective or a scientific perspective perspective we talk about organizational behavior it's categorized in this in this um, uh, um, in this realm of organizational behavior um, and <clears throat> organizational behavior is an actual study of people and groups and organizations and it looks at the dynamics of leadership and management in, the, in an organization it looks at how organizations are structured and designed and how functional they are how effective and efficient they are this is all organizational behavior and it's an actual study in science of how organizations function and run. Um, it is a multidisciplinary field because it looks at understanding individual and group behavior, um, interpersonal processes, and then organizational dynamics and outcomes. So it is a real, um, it is a real critical study, I mean science, behind how we create effective and efficient organizations, how we develop good leaders, how we develop good managers, um, and how you become good followers within an organization and play play your role and do your part. So we talk about management and leadership. Again, I'll repeat what I said earlier. Management is the process of working through individuals and groups to accomplish goals, while leadership is the process of influencing people and activities in individual groups to get sort of a desired um, outcome to achieve a goal in a given situation. So. Uh, I'll mention later, and I'll, but I'll say it again now, you can be, all managers are leaders, but not necessarily all leaders are managers. Um, and then, of course, you can be effective in one way, but maybe not the other. So it's important to be thinking about how do you maintain effectiveness as a leader, um, as a manager, when you be, as a leader, as you become a manager, right? And um, how do you maintain effectiveness as a manager and continue to be a good leader? Um, through all that. So um, when we talk about different um, management styles or approaches to management, there's sort of three theoretical management approaches, the scientific approach, the human relations approach, and the process approach, right? The scientific approach, as you probably could imagine, is <clears throat> about, uh, you know, considering um, uh, pay and work in, working conditions. You know, it's very data-driven. It's scientific, it's rational, it's analytical, right? So you look at managing people through that lens. Um, the human relations approach is human interaction, interpersonal, you know, how, what does the work environment feel like? What is it, what are we missing? What is going to drive people to achieve their goals? Um, so it's an important factor to consider the, the treatment of the workers when you are thinking about looking at managing from a human relations approach. Um, and then the third approach is the process approach, where you focus on managing an organization as a whole entity, um, and you are th oh you're constantly using sort of an ongoing interactive activities to accomplish your goals and objectives. Um, you're you're constantly thinking about how all the all the departments interact <clears throat> and collaborate, and so you're thinking about all of these pieces together. You're not thinking about sort of the individual worker and what their environment is like and what the working conditions are like or their pay is like or their you know those those things that come more out of the scientific and human relations approach the process approach is sort of all about these interconnected parts and how they all work together um, as managers there are functions that um, there are functions that are critical uh, to all managers planning so five main processes that you deal with as a manager are planning staffing, organizing, directing, controlling, and evaluating. Um, planning, staffing, organizing, directing, and controlling, and evaluating. Um, it is, so it's important to remember that all of these processes affect other processes. So, um, sh you know, they, they shouldn't really be viewed as an individual process, but rather they are a process that influence several areas of management. So we can't really... Um, it doesn't really do us any good to plan if we're not thinking about how we're going to staff, how we're going to dive the plan, right? Um, we can't really organize well if we're not willing to direct and control the environment. Um, if we're not evaluating the processes that we're doing and undertaking, nothing else really matters. I mean, we can plan all we want, we can staff all we want, we can organize, direct, and control, but if we're not evaluating to make sh making sure that we're effective, then we are sort of, um, we are doing ourselves a disservice and we're probably not ultimately performing as well as we can be. 
So it is important to be thinking about um, managers at every level make decisions and <clears throat> all of these processes involve decision making. So as a manager, you need to be able to make decisions about planning, staffing, organizing, directing, controlling, and evaluating. Um, you know, so I've certainly worked with plenty of people who are in management roles that are really disorganized, right? That's really difficult to work with someone who's super disorganized if you depend on them. I've also worked with managers who are really not very good at hiring and firing. You know, you, you have to make tough decisions in those, in, the, in that position. You have to make tough decisions about hiring and firing. Um, and so if you can't make those types of decisions, it's hard to step into that role. Um, so, uh, so anyway, um, it's important to realize like all those main processes, there's decisions that have to be made in all those areas. You don't get to just plan something um, and then never make a decision about how you're going to make that plan a reality, right? Um, so we can look at managers from lots of different angles in terms of the different um, areas in which managers can exist. So we can, so we talked about the different theoretical approaches to managing, so how you approach management. We've talked about the, the functions of management, the five main um, processes of management. And now we can look at where the different levels of management occur. So there's top-level management, there's mid-level management, supervisory level management. So there's sort of these three levels of management. And of course, depending on what kind of organization, the size organization you have and whatnot, um, it can, you may have more in certain areas of uh, management. Or you may have just a top-level management and supervisory management. You know, a lot of companies, as they've been resizing, downsizing, right-sizing, however you want to term it, um, you see a lot of that middle management going away. So you have like a supervisory level role of management and a top level of management. But in, but in general or traditionally, um, these three levels of management have different roles and responsibilities, right? So your top level managers... Um, your top level managers are usually what we would call like executives, right? Or senior level, um, senior staff, or um, you know, top the top lead administrator. So it's like these words that you can tell have a lot of power and authority are your top level managers. They're responsible for the entire organization. They have to make the most the the biggest and most critical decisions, right? Um, or if they're not in control of the whole organization, if it's a really large organization and it's pretty decentralized in terms of decision making, they may have a major component of it, right? So a chief financial officer, a chief marketing officer, um, those are the types of people, chief executive officer, right? These are the type of people that have major areas that they're responsible for, and then you have maybe, and then maybe there's like a president or an owner of the organization, kind of depending again on how the size of the organization. But that top of the manager makes the most critical and definitive decisions, um, and they have the most authority, right? Mid-level managers are going to be like what you would call, like their titles might be something like administrative, administrative um, assistant, right? Or um, assistant director, or uh, they might be called, you know, associate directors. Um, they're selected by top level managers, and they they report directly to that top level manager. But then they supervise employees underneath them, right? So they have, they oversee a number of people. They probably direct certain components of an area. So like I think about. Um, like marketing, right? So if you have a chief marketing officer and then you say you have a director of social media marketing or social, um, yeah, so, or social, like social media marketing. So that director then, or, you know, associate director, whatever it's called, right? That's like your mid-level manager. And then under them, they will have then supervisory level directors and supervisory, supervisory level directors then piecemeal out even more of it. So like if you have a social media director, then you probably have someone who oversees Facebook, someone who oversees, um, you know, Twitter, or you may have like one person does all the, you know, this certain aspect of social media uh, marketing, this per the person does the other aspect and looks over a small team that way. So that's sort of how the trickle down effect happens. Those mid-level managers report directly to the top level manager. They manage a department or a unit. Um, 
and they're going to assure that tasks are being performed correctly, right? And if they're not, or they have concerns, they're going to go straight to the top level manager. That supervisory level, they're like a first line manager, right? So they're the first kind of contact. They usually are called a supervisor or they're called a coordinator, something to that effect. That's usually like the title that you would see in the um, job, like in the job um, role or the, the position. Um, these are first line people who report to a mid-level manager. So there's a step between them and a top level manager, at least one step, if not a couple. Um, they still oversee employees, but it's probably a smaller amount of employees. It might be even like one or two employees, depending. Um, and they usually, those people are typically called like technical specialists or operatives. Like the, those are the people like they don't have any management responsibility, no leadership role um, that's specifically designated, right? Um, and so, the, and they don't really have any authority to go to management. You know, they um, above that supervisory level, typically, right? Um, so again, like this is this is this is all dependent on the size of an organization. Smaller organizations certainly don't have lots of mid-level managers. They probably have. Um, uh, you know, a number of top level managers and less supervisory level managers, but it depends. It just depends. But you get it. You get a sense. And when you're looking at jobs, job descriptions, or the role or the positions of jobs, it's important to think about what kind of a name is listed. You know, is it like is it um, entry level? Is it does it say supervisor? Does it say coordinator? Because those are gonna those are going to be more supervisory level. If it says director or assistant director or associate director, then that's more mid-level. And, of course, executive or administrator, um, you know, those are going to be those top-level managers. So it's important to know those words so that you know sort of what kind of level you might be stepping into when it comes to um, working in an organization. Um, so then there's three categories of, of effective administrators and their skills that they can use. Um, there's conceptual, human relations, and, and um, technical. And these skills, so it's not, this isn't about like how you look at running your, or managing your people. This is really about the, the skills that you use to, um, you know, uh, figure out solutions and deal with problems. Um, if you're conceptual, if you have um, effective skills that are conceptual skills, then you identify the root of a problem um, as opposed to like the symptoms of a problem. You really find out like, what is causing, um, you know, what is really the root of our issue with low ticket sales or um, low, att yeah, low attendance at home events. Um, you're not gonna, just going to find, like, the symptom of a problem, but you're going to find the root of the problem. Human relations are those interpersonal skills. Again, so if you're thinking about humans and how we interact, um, you think about um, how you develop these, how you motivate people in the work environment so that you can be more efficient and effective. Um, these are really essential for a, um, a sport manager daily on a daily basis because it's it is a industry of people, right? This is what we do all the time is like manage and or work with people. Um, and then technical is like knowing the everyday tasks of the job. Like I can do that. Um, I can do any little aspect of the job. I can run the the computer program. I can interact with people. Um, in customer service, I can um, check things, uh, you know, with in terms of security. You know, you know, you understand the technical details of the job, and so when managers have those ability, that makes them um, obviously very well rounded and understand the organization from top to bottom. Um, and I think it makes them uh, pretty reputable with their workers because they recognize that they care about all the details and all the aspects of organization. So um, so that's kind of management stuff. Now I'm going to move to leadership stuff and its distinction from management. Um, again, the main difference between leadership, it's broader than management. Um, you know, managers, the diff big diff biggest difference between managers and leaders lies in the way that they accomplish objectives. It's important to realize that managers are often leaders, but leaders are not necessarily managers. So you can have people who lead really well in their area or what they do or they lead kind of their crew that's doing the technical job but they may not be a manager um, and servant leadership is probably the most effective form of leadership in today's society people really respond to that um, 
but I do think it's important to, to think about like managers focus on efficiency and doing things right. Leaders, leaders focus on effectiveness and doing the right things. Um, and you know, it's important that you realize that sport industry organiza sport industry organizations require managers to be skilled leaders. So it's really good to be thinking about how as a leader can you be interactive? How can you be a servant leader? How can you in exert influence on people toward goal achievement? Because that is really what people want is that a leader that can help them achieve their goals. Um, so one of the biggest theories of leadership is the contingency theory. It's been really well looked at and re researched and um, is a very modern concept of theory uh, of leadership that people resonate with because it's a very effective style of leadership because it depends on the situation you lead depending on what the situation presents and there's sort of three there's um, there's no best way to lead a company or lead an organization or to make a decision or to organize the corporation but what you're doing is you're taking um, the optimal course of action, which is contingent upon internal and external situations. And it's <clears throat> and the contingency theory has a multi-dimensional look at leadership because it includes the leader's traits, their power of their power of influence and goals, the followers' expectations, and then the context in which you're working. So you're looking at what the leader brings, what the followers um, expect and what they value, and then what the context is and that can be defined a couple of different ways the context could be defined by organizational complexity how big and complex is the organization and then like the, the task uncertainty so let's just break the, let's break out the contingency theory just a little bit more specifically and talk first about the first component which is the leader right the leader's traits and the power of influence and their power the power of influence and goals um, so the first thing with the contingency of leader theory of leadership is the leader right like I as leader what I'm responsible for um, you know being in control of this group and like you know having um, the ability to have the to have my followers get buy-in right so I'm able to um, uh, motivate them and inspire them to have buy-in and commit to whatever it is that we're gonna do so if it's organizational change that they commit to change if it's um, a specific task we need to get done that they're committing to that task and the way we're gonna uh, operate that task. Um, so the goal of the leader is to influence people to follow them a certain path, right, towards whatever kind of that end goal is. Then you have to think about the followers role in this. Like they have to have an interactive um, part with a relationship with the leader and followers they followers like to know that a leader wants to have their input, right? Um, they are a vital component to the change process or whatever process you're going through because they are going to be the ones that are going to be getting the job done, right? Um, and their expectations and values have to align with the leader's goals to impact effective like outcomes because if they don't, if they're really, if they're really um, dissonant from one another, then it's not going to be a very effective um, relationship and environment to work in. And then the last part is the context, right? And that looks at like the complexity of the organization and the task uncertainty. This will guide the leader, um, the leadership, and the followers in terms of the most appropriate course of action. Um, and of course, just as a reminder, comp organizational complexity, which we talked a little bit about on Wednesday, is the size of the organization, the location of the workspace. Um, so the larger an organization is, the greater distance there is between leaders and followers, and so it's harder. You have to work a lot harder to get to your followers and influence them and motivate them, and you have to be really clear communic communication-wise on what those values and goals are so that you, the followers can, can align with them, can tell if they align with them or not. Um, and then task uncertainty, this, this is something that influence, influences leaders' ability to cope with change in, um, in a sport organization because tasks can range from very routine and repetitive to innovative, novel, and just non-repetitive. So there can be like a level of certainness, like I know this is what we're going to have to get done, and then there's going to be that whole extra component of you're not ready for it, you don't know, you're, you're not, you don't know what's going to pop up. Um, I think about this a lot with sport teams, right? We don't know things are going to 
come into our path and create hurdles for us. So we have to be ready for that uncertainty and how we're going to just manage through and navigate some of those things. So the contingency theory of leadership thinks about the leader's traits, the followers, and their values and how they um, line up with the leader and then that context. And those are the three components of the contingency theory of leadership. And through all that, you will have leaders that will demonstrate certain styles of leadership. Um, and certainly, um, leadership approaches have um, some leadership-focused leadership traits, behaviors, and situations. Um, you know, leadership leadership styles, like typically managers engage in a full range of leadership styles, but to varying degrees, right? So you have... Um, you, so a lot of leaders, they exhibit certain one style quite often, but they could exhibit different styles of leadership in certain situations. Um, and so I think really good leaders, again, think about um, how what maybe a certain situation calls for, right? Again, I think about sort of old school coaches that just coach one way and one way only, and they don't think about that certain situations may call for a slightly different approach in how you are leading your group, right? They really are sort of like, my way or the highway, no holds bar, it worked before, it should work now. When really, we really are in this day and age recognizing the rich diversity of athletes that come to our teams. And if we are doing that, we rec we need to recognize that while we may exhibit um, overall a certain type of leadership style that's dominant, we need to be willing to maybe look at some different ways to lead in certain in certain time when when it's clear that the group needs that or maybe some individuals need that to be better motivated and inspired to continue moving forward, right? Um, so leadership styles, you know, there's sort of these three kind of three broad areas, transactional, transformational, and laissez-faire. Laissez-faire is not really a leadership style, but you will find that there are leaders like this that are just kind of passive. They avoid leadership. Um, well, it's not really a leadership style. There are there are leaders that will just kind of like uh, pass the buck, right? They don't make decisions. They're wishy-washy. Oh, it's really rough to work with them. Um, but it's true. They just kind of, they like to have the, the position of power and decision making, but they don't really make decisions or they don't make good decisions. They don't take into consideration the people around them. Um, transformation or transactional is very process oriented. Um, you really think about people who are very much like, this is how we're going to do it. This is the steps we have to do to get there. And these are the goals that we want. You oftentimes think about um, leading through contingent reward systems, right? So you have, this is the outcome you want. These are the expectations I have. And then here's going to be the reward if you get there, right? Um, so you you uh, you see very transactional leaders in doing a lot of that contingent reward system. Um, they can be very active, which in, in which they correct followers when mistakes are observed, or they can be passive. They um, they correct mistakes after everything is said and done. So they they're very passive in terms of how they um, lead you. Again, the, a good time to be thinking about leaders when we're talking about these styles is coaches because. There's coaches that are very transactional, very much like uh, all about the output, and then there are some that are very um, transformational, and that's the ideal type of leader, a transformational leader, because they think about the whole process. They want to be involved in the whole process. How are you acting and performing throughout the whole process? And it isn't just about the output. It's not just about the outcome, right? So um, they think about, so, so having an idealized influence, they want to be a good role model and make sure they're doing the right thing so that you do the right thing. Um, they're very motivational. They may be someone who encourages a lot of optimism and, and, and motivation, enthusiasm. Um, they may be very intellectually stimulating. So they're innovative and they come up with really interesting ideas and they encourage you to be creative with your solutions. Um, or just they're very individualized in how they consider you as a leader, right? They pay personal attention to what your needs are. They're not just thinking, they don't just have a group think, like everybody's one way and we're all robots, right? They're they're like, okay, well, this person needs this and this person needs that. This person needs this. So I'm going to sort of think about that and cater to those people as I lead them. Um, so transformational leaders tend to have the most influence over people, um, ultimate influence over people. And um, 
and uh, have sort of the most um, beneficial outputs from um, outcomes from their followers because they show that they there's a level of care that goes into how they lead versus if it's very transactional. Um, but both can be successful and both have found plenty of success when we talk about transactional versus transformational. But in today's like leadership world, you'll hear people really emphasizing the need for transformational leaders um, across the board in every kind of organizational format. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is decision making, authority and power. Um, you know, decisions are an integral part of, uh, of the activities of leaders and managers and employees. Um, undertake that they that employees undertake in, in their day-to-day -day work right so um, people must consider all factors involved in the decision making um, and make decisions within parameters set out by leaders and by the circumstance and by the goals and values that you want to attain some decisions are certainly easier to make than others um, you know but de but decisions involving significant resources like time personnel financial resources um, you know, then we have to think about how those are going to take more time, right? If they are very involving, say, like decisions on the construction of a stadium, perhaps, or like a facility, right? These are going to take lots of time. They're not going to be snap decisions. They're not going to be without lots of fret and thought. Um, and you want to be thinking about how many people you want to add to the decision making process without it becoming too many people and too many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. So there's not really a decision in the end being made. Um, so uh, we want to be thinking about all decision-making processes have six steps. Um, it may appear, um, although decision-making may appear rational and consensual, power can also play a, pro a part in the process of decision-making. So you want to be sure that people aren't overstepping their the boundaries of power and they're not just using their power to make decisions they're they are taking into consideration all things that are necessary so decision making is a six-step process you want to define or frame the problem you want to identify the criteria for the decision um, then you want to develop and evaluate all the alternatives you don't want to just say like this is the only dis solution that we have you want to look at all the different ways in which you could come up with a solution you want to select an alternative you want to implement the alternative and then you want to um, evaluate the effectiveness of a decision, right? So again, you really evaluating is a very important part in decision making. I mean, sorry, is it in, in management and leading people? You want to make sure you're always evaluating and assessing, right? This is why it's important to us at the end of semesters that students fill out a course evaluations because we want to be evaluating how we're doing. Are we doing a good job at um, you know leading you and helping you develop intellectually? And critically um, and you know and, and also making an enjoyable experience in your learning environment so right like this is why evaluations are important and this is why they're a valuable part of um, assessment of uh, what we do in any organization um, so you can you can read more about what each of those steps involve in your book because they they sort of explain a little bit further I'm gonna I'm gonna stop kind of there with my um, description about that and then uh, the last thing I just want to talk about is the dis distinction between authority and power. So authority is defined as the power to enforce rules and um, to expect subordination from those who have no authority. Authority falls under legitimate power, and those with legitimate power in organizations have authority. Um, power is often perceived at the individual level of analysis um, where organizational actors through various sources like your position or your personality or the resources you have have power that can be exercised in decision-making processes. Um, in the absence of such sources of power, influencing decisions in an organization is difficult. So if you don't have anybody that has sort of the, uh, uh, the power, uh, have, has some level of power um, within an organization, you might have a hard time getting decisions made, um, which can make things kind of tricky and difficult. Um, so yeah, so I think overall, um, you know, it's important for you to understand through this chapter the, the, dis the distinction between managing and leading, how to do those effectively, how to do both of those effectively, um, the different ways that you can approach management, the different ways you can approach leadership, what kind of leadership style do you have, you know, as you go through Wittenberg, um, and for those of you that ha are already seniors, you probably have done some kind of leadership assessment or like, 
you know, um, personality assessment that helps you understand what kind of a leader you are. So what you tend to be in most situations, but then it helps you develop and look at what are other ways you could lead. So again, it, it can give you a more well-rounded way to be a good leader. So um, hopefully you, you kind of gain some perspective there with good leadership and management styles. Um, I do want you to finish the, or do the reflection from chapter five and submit it tomorrow, no later then five o'clock so that's Saturday of spring break so you might want to just get it done now so you don't have to um, wait any longer to do any more homework um, and then again enjoy spring break um, read chapter 12 you know before you get into class on Monday and we'll start with marketing right away on Monday um, and also I just want to remind you don't forget about your small interview your small group interview project that's going to be coming up pretty fast after spring break that that's going to be due so you're going to want to be working on that if you haven't done anything with that yet you need to get on that schedule an, an interview, get that interview done, and get get, start in, get starting to write on that paper. Um, hope everybody has a great spring break. Stay safe, enjoy, relax, um, and we'll see you guys in a little over a week. Take care.